Ever since Hank Hill graced the Commonwealth and spread the good word about propane and propane accessories, I've gotten tons of requests for a certain character to also make his appearance. So that's exactly what this video is. Can you beat Fallout 4 as Dale Gribble? The rules are simple. To only wear things that Dale would wear, which consist of his normal attire, his work uniform, and a special outfit for later, and for weapons he can only use the Reba 2 rifle and the Deliverer pistol. However, craftables are also allowed because this run wouldn't be complete without pocket sand. With that out of the way, let's get into the run. Dale! Hey! Ah! Oh man. Dale, you went too oh, far this time! Stay back here! Come here, I'm gonna kick your ass! No! No! I'm hey. gonna kick it harder if you don't come over here! You didn't have fired me! You know what I'm like! After creating the world's finest pest exterminator, it was time to set the stats. Dale isn't going to win any strongman contests, so we're going to drop strength to 1, but being able to spot government conspiracies from miles away will give him an 8 in perception. Endurance and charisma drop to 1 as homie doesn't look like he's had a decent feed in a while, and unless you talk to people who are also conspiracy theorists, your social skills are going to be lacking. Intelligence at 3 for knowing how to not die while spraying toxic fumes while exterminating, and a 4 in agility to be able to run away from danger or a pissed off Hank Hill. But the most important stat of all is luck at 10. This man should be dead 10 times over and still is somehow kicking. If that's not lucky, I don't know what is. Before heading out to gather his weapons for the run, Dale crafted up some traps and tools to help him survive the long hike ahead of him. On his travels, Dale passed by some raiders who were training their dogs, but Dale wanted to help them out by cheering them on with the contents from his pockets. After traveling across what seemed like the entire commonwealth, I told you this would be a long journey, Dale arrived at the Rook family house. Except instead of a nice howdy do, he was greeted by Mirelurks trying to shank him for their millionth dollar. So instead, Dale had to improvise by throwing down some spicy Legos, a fresh dose of pocket sand, and an impromptu crab boil. With the Mirelurks dealt with, Dale was allowed inside by Barney who was facing an even bigger dilemma. Apparently he couldn't actually shoot the rifle he was holding because ain't nobody got time for that, so Dale was sent to set up some automated turrets to fend off any other blood hungry crustaceans that would arrive. And that agility was coming in handy as when you need to dodge some pissed off pitchy boys, breaking some ankles is a necessity. After setting up the turrets and returning to Barty, Dale was given the Reba 2 hunting rifle, with a special effect of dealing more damage to Mirelurks and bugs. This seemed like a no brainer to grab, only problem is, it came with no ammo. For someone so lucky, this definitely didn't seem very cash money. So in an attempt to make some money to get some ammo, Dale visited everyone's favorite police station to watch how people who can afford the finer things in life deal with the hordes of poor people fighting over the last breadcrumb. But because he took the scrounger perk, this meant he could just loot the fresh bodies to grab some much needed ammo. Now with some ammo to defend himself, he made his way to Diamond City to figure out what he needed to do next. As a new face on the block, extermination jobs weren't just going to find themselves. Luckily, Diamond City was able to help not only for ammo, but job leads. Turns out this hidden group called the Railroad was recruiting new members, and word on the street is that they didn't like the government. Dale could not run over fast enough to sign up. He met with Desdemona, and once she started asking about the Institute and freeing synthetic humans, all Dale could hear was working towards bringing down a government organization and giving them hell for abusing his tax dollars. So of course, he was on board. But before he could become an honorary member of the Thomas the Tank Engine fan club, first he had to travel with Deacon on a mission to prove himself. Turns out, one of the major railroad base of operations had been attacked, so Dale and Deacon had to suss it out. Between some very questionable misses and Dale using his expert knowledge of aim here and pull the trigger from his gun club, Deacon and Dale found no survivors, but did find a pretty sweet secret agent pistol that he got to keep. With the Deliverer and Reba 2, Dale was officially set for firearms. At least for now, but that's something we'll cover later. Returning to Desdemona, Dale was officially recruited into the railroad, and now came the reason I forgot Rick Sanchez could have killed the railroad. In my many videos playing as characters who don't wear armor, I've had countless comments tell me to get the Ballistic Weave, and to their credit, it's super useful. But to get it, you have to do some house cleaning for the railroad first. 
Dale was tasked with meeting Old Man Stockton at Bunker Hill to help him get his sent to freedom. The meeting was short and sweet, and the next thing Dale knew, he was escorting not nice individuals into a permanent retirement inside a holy place. Because trust me, this sentence was much better than the one I previously had. Dale waited until midnight, and then the railroad runner arrived to help cart the synth to safety. Continuing with house cleaning, Dale was assigned to check in on another location that had gone dark. This is a common theme with the railroad. It honestly seems like the only people who don't get smacked into a million pieces are the ones you meet under the Old North Church. Other than that, they might as well be a red shirt in Star Trek. Arriving at the safe house, this time Dale took a slower approach and methodically took out the raiders inside. There was a super scary death claw hidden away on the deeper levels, but one single lunchbox sent it packing. Next came a mission to find a hidden cache full of gear for the railroad, and besides the three gunners he had to fight to get to it, it wasn't anything special. With all of these basic quests out of the way, this is what was supposed to unlock the ballistic weave. Tinker Tom would say a line of dialogue and away you go. Except I'm about to piss a lot of you guys off. If you talk to Tom before starting these missions, normally you'd have your goal. But I didn't talk to him. I didn't know I needed to talk to him. So Dale was just gonna have to do more quests. Go ahead and take a guess how many quests do you think that is, because I don't think you'll actually get it. So continuing quest for Locomotion Central, Dale went to track down Agent Blackbird who had supposedly gone missing with his signal only just popping back up. That line to get milk ain't no joke. But our fallen homie continued to sleep on the ground. He wasn't gonna make it to the Christmas party. Moving on, Dale was sent to clear out another location, except besides the horde of pissed off Krabby Krabs, since also roamed these halls. The Marlocks required some purging by fire, mainly because Dale's aim was not the best when a giant mass of murder was charging at him, but the synths caught the best of Reba too. This rifle was putting in work dealing enough damage to usually two-shot the synths, plus with the range it brought to the table, this was a perfect weapon for dealing with targets trying to hide. Proving his worth to Desdemona, he was paired with Glory to clear out a network of old metro tunnels used for transporting runaway synths across the Commonwealth. But between a heavy gunner with a minigun and a man thriving off living a real-life undercover secret agent movie, these raiders and synths never stood a chance. But after returning to HQ, Tinker Tom finally wanted to work with Dale. But was it for the Ballistic Weave? No, of course it wasn't! It was for a completely different string of side quests involving putting up cameras to spy on the Institute so we could catch them tampering with our food. But, at the sound of spying on the government, Dale couldn't say yes fast enough. Q constant side quests setting up cameras across the Commonwealth for Tinker Tom. I mean, Dale was all over the place. He was in Corvega, Backstreet Apparel, and even the College Square Station. All just set up cameras and hope that the Institute would be dumb enough to do something. But as repetitive as these quests were, it did cause Tinker Tom to start selling the good kush. And man, this guy was packing heat. He was selling all of the max upgrades for the Deliverer, meaning Dale didn't even need the gun nut perk at this point because between the Reba 2 and because of the fact that he had so many caps from doing odd jobs, he could just afford to buy all the big upgrades outright. Think of this as a mission to go spread the good word of freedom by giving everyone a healthy serving of lead and then being rewarded with parts to make your bullet handouts more effective. Sign me up! Dale was sent to the chem lab that Walter White had to break up on top of a broken highway in the sky and even had to deal with people who play Mystic Mind decks in Yu-Gi-Oh. Just play something else, man. If this seems like I'm summing these up quickly, it's because there's 11 of these quests and they all involve running to the area, unaliving everything that moves, and then setting up a camera for Tom. But at the end of this quest chain, I still didn't have the option for Ballistic Weave. I don't know what I did, but something told me Dale wouldn't be getting that spiffy new shirt. So now having done so many quests for the railroad that no one would give me any more or so much as talk to him, Dale set out to find another way to ruin the government, and one such tip he got was tracking down a detective named Nick Valentine. But Nick was being held captive by a rowdy bunch called the Triggermen. Normally you would just walk up to their front door and ask if Nick could come out and play, but sadly these guys wanted to play the hard way. So Dale had to show them what happens to people who get in the way of a rescue mission. Between auditioning for FaZe Clan and sharing his ever-growing piles of sand, these guys didn't stand much of a chance. However, I will say using the pocket sand in junction with the demolitions expert at rank 2 is kinda dumb. 
The range on the sand is super short, so it just clogs your vision. After rescuing Nick and seeing that since participate in Halloween, the unlikely duo fought their way through the remaining Triggermen, which is no surprise considering Dale is about the same level as when I normally finish one of these runs, and met with Skinny Malone. Diplomacy was out of the question, so the usual pocket sand and bullets were served to the wannabe gangsters. With Nick free and back in Diamond City, Dale informed him that he was looking for a way to bring down the Institute. It's your quote unquote pollution controls. I heard on talk radio you don't even need them. They're just neghead government plot. How is cutting down on pollution a government plot, Dale? Open up your eyes, man. They're trying to control global warming. Get it? Global. So what? That's code for UN commissars telling Americans what temperature it's going to be in our outdoors. I say let the world warm up. See what Boutros Boutros golly golly thinks about that. We'll grow oranges in Alaska. Nick being convinced that Dale was just crazy enough to attempt this informed him that he would have to track down an institute assassin named Kellogg for more details. So after a quick hike, Dale was now in Fort Hagen fighting through sins to get to the target. But in doing missions for the railroad, he was well versed at how many bullets it took to dissemble an Institute minion. Further in, he met with Kellogg and the conversation went about as you'd expect. You have to be the stupidest man on the planet to think this is a good idea. Have you seen what you're wearing? That outfit makes you look like a sequin train wreck. And after highlighting Kellogg's invisible figure in pocket sand, Dale was able to grab a brain transplant that held all of Kellogg's secrets and take it back to Omari and Good Neighbor to dive through his memories to learn how to next proceed. So now with enough insider information to make Dale the employee of the month, he was tasked with going and finding Virgil, a rogue institute scientist in the glowing sea, but nothing would have prepared him for what was to come. If you're thinking it was death claws or rad scorpions, nah. Try an intergalactic envoy of assassins sent to take down the man who, if given the chance, would capture a Zetanim paraded around like one giant case of I told you so. Normally the Glowing Sea isn't the nicest neighborhood to begin with, but damn, these guys were actually trying to kill Dale. But using his newfound Commonwealth assassin memories, he was able to take out the Zetans and make it to Virgil. The Jolly Green Giant gave Dale every ounce of detail he could to help bring about the destruction of the Institute, but Dale would have to go get the last missing piece himself, a Courser Chip. Now, making his way over to Green Check Genetics, Mr. Gribble fought through the gunners inside. But when you have a man who has mastered the art of pocket sand and has done more missions for the railroad than he's done for the main story of the game, the gunners didn't stand a chance. Making it to the Courser, our hero fought to the death and retrieved the chip. Now all he had to do was get it deciphered, which Tinker Tom was more than happy to help with. Returning to Virgil got him the plans to build a teleporter to finally make it inside the Institute, and production could begin. But before heading in, Desdemona told him that there was a contact inside who was waiting to talk with him, so Dale couldn't raise suspicion while infiltrating. But little did she know, Dale had prepared for this his entire life. Thus, Rusty Shackleford was created, a perfect alias to sneak into the Institute as a potential new hire. So in walked Rusty to see if father could take the bait, and upon seeing a child in a cage, he just knew these guys needed to be brought down. Upon talking to father about the lack of insurance packages, Rusty was allowed into the Institute and was able to meet with Patriot, the contact for the Thomas the Tank Engine fan club. Patriot had a big operation underway to help free all the synths in the Institute. Rusty up until this point had already decided that the Institute was the worst thing to ever exist, so of course he would help break some homies out of jail. Only problem is, Patriot needed a password from an old war computer. Before heading out to do some old world raids, Rusty met up with the other scientists in the Institute to maintain his cover. Once the meet and greet was sorted, Rusty, aka Dale, met back up with the cult of Choo Choo Charles to find the location of the super secret no one would have ever known password which just so happens to be in Cambridge Polymer Lab. But instead of heading through the lab and mixing up the chemicals, Dale infiltrated the lab and stole the password via brute force and 10mm round diplomacy. Upon returning back to Patriot and Z114, Dale, aka Rusty, gave up the password and the next part of the super secret breakout of the homies out of jail plan could proceed. Right after Rusty did more missions to cement himself into the Institute, he got tasked with hunting down a rogue synth that was making Jeffrey Dahmer seem like an amateur. Rusty traveled to the flotilla base, only to be ambushed by the Zetans again. Apparently fending them off in the glowing sea was a big no-no by alien standards, and so they were out for blood. 
But as Rusty was deep in combat, the Brotherhood of Steel showed up and even helped fight off some of the last Settons, only to then be ambushed by the Children of Adam. While playing this, I didn't think the Children of Adam would be able to do anything. That is until they brought down the Vertebrae. Rusty couldn't believe his eyes either as he just watched the Brotherhood extract their vengeance. Now back on track, Rusty made his way through the flotilla and tried to warn Gabriel to warn Synth about the coming oppression and to break the hold the Institute had, but then the passcode was said and Gabriel was whisked away. Returning to the Institute, Z114 informed Rusty that guards needed to be taken out to allow some Synths to begin building a resistance. They didn't even have dental. Somehow his cover wasn't blown, and Father handed him his next mission to capture Sins at Bunker Hill. But of course, Rusty warned the railroad ahead of time, and then took out his handler before beginning the assault. Except where he expected a mass shootout, it seemed like no one cared that he was here. It's amazing what happens when you're friendly with three different factions. Rusty made it inside the basement to free the sense and then reported to Father. Apparently too many Institute minions got bing-bonged and he was suspicious, but still held a board meeting saying what a great job Rusty was doing and was praising him as the employee of the month. Rusty, still trying to figure out what kind of low standards the Institute had for its employees, was suddenly tasked with hunting down a super battery to power the Institute for years and years on end. So he, along with an Institute scientist, smashed into a Brotherhood of Steel occupied base. Luckily, Rusty didn't have to hide the fact that his other alias is the president of the Arlen Gun Club and had no problem sharing bullets with everyone. They retrieved the battery and showed no mercy to the opposition guarding the exit. With the Institute being powered for the next bajillion years, Rusty now had to go yell at an Institute scientist for being trapped in a closet before he was abducted by the Institute. With all of the corporate espionage going on, Rusty had never forgotten about his train enthusiast club, and just at that moment, Z-114 informed him that the Brotherhood were charging their base. Rusty, aka Dale, made his way to his homies before the violence could begin, and had to fight off the Brotherhood members. But being a self-employed exterminator proved extremely useful as now Dale knew how to topple foes with his rifle, making taking them out all the more easier. But rather than count the day as a victory, Desdemona informed Dale that he would be leading a small team to take the Brotherhood out of the picture permanently. But at the sound of more espionage, Dale couldn't help himself. Together with Tinker, Tom, and Deacon, the trio stormed the Cambridge police station. Taking care of the guards here was child's play, but instead of children, they were a militia full of people who idolized Buzz Lightyear. With the Brotherhood dispatched, Tinker Tom managed to fly a vertebrate to the magic sky blimp of doom, and this is where Dale would come in. He would have to sneak on board in disguise and plant explosives to take out the base, which is a lot easier said than done. What is your <laughs> but after playing a game of hide and seek with the only snitch on the blimp, the base was rigged and Dale and friends were able to fly to safety before watching the fireworks. With the Brotherhood destroyed, now it was time to end the Institute. Rusty made one more appearance inside before taking out the guards and shedding his sheep's clothing, like the slimy lizard he is. This allowed the railroad to be teleported inside and the final assault could begin. And what better way to end the final fight than with Dale's old job shining bright. Our heroes fought their way through to the reactor and rigged it to explode before teleporting out and taking in the sight as the biggest conspiracy theory went up in flames. All thanks to a Mr. Gribble. This run definitely falls more under the category of a themed run, because between the Reba 2 and the Deliverer, the damage wasn't ever an issue, and the pocket sand caused so many distractions that it completely diffused some fights. 10 out of 10, would recommend. If you liked what you saw, please consider subscribing as it helps the channel out a ton. However, if you'd like to support in other ways, I launched a Patreon to turn this hobby into a full-time job. The Patreon includes some behind the scenes content while I make the videos and get your name in the credits. However, if you don't feel like joining, there's also a donation tab in the description. But just watching and liking the video is more than enough support. Please don't feel like you have to join either one of those other ones. If you have a suggestion for a challenge run you'd like to see, let me know in the comments below. I play all sorts of games, so no challenges off the table. And as far as Dust at 1 HP goes, I have about three weeks off from work coming up, so I'm going to attempt streaming whenever I get the chance. So make sure to keep an eye on the community tab for the link. I want to thank all of you that watched to this point, and as always, I have been Chris from Crisis Gaming, and I will see you on the next one.